Um, do I have uh, your approval to sign the minutes of the council meetings held on the 20th September and the 18th of October as correct records of the proceedings? So moved. Thank you very much. Um, and do we have any apologies for absence? Yes, we have apologies from Councillor Brown, Byrne, Drayson, Johnson, Mooney, Osborne, Stevens and Vinehall. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, are there any disclosures by members of personal and disclosable pecuniary interest in matters on the agenda? If so, please declare the nature of such interests and whether members regard the personal interest as traditional under the terms of the Code of Conduct. Councillor Maynard. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chairman. Um, if it is called, I think Council Tax Reduction Scheme outcome of consultation on proposed changes, so that's CB12155, insofar as I'm an executive member of East Sussex County. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Um, members are reminded to reiterate interest at the time the matter is discussed. Um, as you're aware, our, our chair isn't here this evening. He's unwell. And uh, on his behalf, we'll be reading out his um, report. Having sensibly proposed, postponed our last meeting due to its proximity to the Christmas holiday period and the prevalence of the Omicron variant of covid I'd like to start by saying how nice it is to see everyone here this evening. Well, I do know he's watching, so. Events, as you may guess, have been few and far between, with a couple that were planned being cancelled at short notice because of COVID. On the plus side, you won't have to listen to me for too long. Um, on the 22nd of October, I was pleased to be able to open the Bexhill Art Society's annual exhibition at the Delaware. Their first exhibition was back in 1961, and having missed out in 2020, they were very happy to hold this year's event. I was immediately given the almost impossible task of picking my favourite print for an award. Having risen to the challenge, the piece I chose was the first to be sold. Alas, before I could consult with my wife about buying it for our home. I was able to present the council and lay a wreath on behalf of Brother at the Remembrance Service at Rye on Sunday the 14th of November. Having been invited by the Rye branch of the Royal British Legion, and this was preceded by a short ceremony on Remembrance Day itself. When I was joined at the town hall steps by many councillors and officers for a two-minute silence at 11 o'clock, on Wednesday, the 1st of December, I was very pleased to be able to attend the Switch On event for the Christmas lights display in Westfield. I've only been in London for four years, but I've made the journey there to see it every year, having first stumbled upon it by accident. I was joined by the Mayor of Hastings, Councillor James Bacon, who was representing the link between the Westfield lights and St Michael's Hospice to which any donations were given. The lights this year raised over £16,000, and since 2015, Westfield Christmas lights have donated almost 110000 to the hospice in St Leonard's. Interesting. While I was there, I also got the answer to a question I've often pondered. One of the householders reassured me that if you are thinking of buying a house in that part of Westfield, you do get warned about the lights. As the school's carol service at the Delaware Pavilion and the Bexhill Choral Society Christmas concert were both lost to COVID, Westfield was the end of my official visits. And so, without wishing everyone a happy new year on the last day of January, I'd like to finish by wishing members, officers, business owners, and residents a better and safer 2022. Um, I know Brian would want to, and I'd like to also say and offer our sincere condolences to Lisa Cooper, who may you know lost her mum recently. Okay, so item five, which is to answer any questions from a member of the public. And um, in accordance with paragraph 10 of the council procedure rules, so I believe we have a question from Mr. Bernard Brown. 
to Councillor Kevin Dixon. Um, Mr Brown, would you like to read out your question? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, sadly, Councillor Dixon didn't answer my question in his reply. Um, the Chief Finance Officer has confirmed the reserves of the Council increased between 2014 and 19, but currently and they are going to fall down below 5 million with the risk of a Section 114 notice having to be issued. I was trying to understand how under the Financial Stability Programme this would actually work and how it would impact particularly on Bex Hill. Because in a straight line devolution of costs by tax um, base, Bex Hill taxpayers face a minimum increase of £44 per household per year. Because the policy, which is of devolution of discretionary services, is to devolve the service but not the money. Councillor Vine Hall publicly said that the waiting for this would be much heavier for Bexhill. So that means there'd be a bigger burden for the people of Bexhill residents. It might seem a surprise as a resident of Battle that I'm asking the question, but it's because it affects all of Brother. Mr. Brown, would you mind if yeah, I could ask what the question is, please? I'm getting to the question right now. Thank Chairman. you. At Cabinet, Councillor Dixon said without qualification, public conveniences will be maintained. If the costs to the parish and town councils of devolution of discretionary services is too great and they refuse to take them, how will this be dealt with in the financial stability plan? If the councils think it's too onerous, what is plan B for dealing with this? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for his question. Um, obviously, you don't want to, the original answer to the original question, and I apologise that you don't think that we answered the question sufficiently. And, and just a note on that is that you can't actually uh, divide out Bexhill from the rest of the district, as some of the contracts are just district wide, they're not specified into various parishes. So we can't do that at that time. Clearly, that work will have to be done as we get further down this programme. In relation to public conveniences, no decisions have been made about what we're going to do with public conveniences. There is some work going on at the moment to see whether we can upgrade and actually charge, um, as a lot of places do for public conveniences, particularly in places like Camber, uh, where there are a lot of tourists. So, unfortunately, I can't really answer that question at the moment. Um, it's not this, in, this administration's intention to close toilets where people don't want the toilets closed, and we will not be doing that. But we do have to find a, a better way of paying for it because it's quite a drain about between 400 and 500,000 pounds per year on the council's finances and clearly since we don't have any um, government help anymore no government grant no settlement that we've got to manage to get our, our books to balance it's a difficult subject but it's something that we're determined madam chairman to uh, to solve over the next next year or so thank you Thank you, Councillor Dixon. Uh, Mr. Brown, I think your supplemental question were kind of included in your statement, so we'll move on. Okay. Um, you can remain for the rest of the meeting, Mr. Brown, or you can leave us now if you so wish. So now on to item six, which is to answer questions from members of the council, if any, in accordance with paragraph 11 of the council procedure rules. I don't think we have any. Sure. Oh, I, I put in an application this morning uh, and I left it on Lisa's phone message if no one's picked it up. I presume it was, I didn't know about a mum or anything. Chairman, I, I, we, we've not picked that up so I can only apologise for that. Um, there is another council meeting um, coming up at the end of um, February, I believe, or March. We can happily take it up there, Councillor Carroll. It was just about my area and the way the money's being told to people and with everything that's costing, that they've got bad feelings up there and it's not good. I just want to go back and tell them things that could be happening. And so can we complete 
put that on the next council meeting, please, Mr. Carroll. Well, Apologies have been made. Somebody should be able to say something now. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now we move on to item seven. Um, to receive a report of the Cabinet on matters for determination by full council at its meetings held on the 4th of October, 8th of November and the 30th of December. Uh, council Oliver, please. Sorry, 4th of I'm sorry, I, haven't, I expect was, I can't quite read what I'm going to say here, but um, um, to move the report of the Cabinet meetings held on the 4th of October, 8th of November and 13th of December and the 10th of January be approved and um, adopted. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Councillor Prosher. If members wish to reserve an item for discussion, please indicate as I call over. 4th of October, CB 21-39, updated statement of community involvement. 8th of November, CB 21-48, Street litter, infrastructure, and dra draft litter strategy for other. 13th of December, CB 21-55, Council Tax Reduction Scheme, Outcome of Consultation to Postpone Changes. Uh, yes, please. And CB 21-56, New Community Infrastructure Levy Governance and the Proposal for Appointment of Strategic Community Infrastructure Levy Funds. CB 21-57, Designation of Monitoring Officer and Chief Finance Officer. CB 21-66, updated local planning enforcement plan. Thank you. I move that the whole of the report, with the exception of the reserve minutes, be approved and adopted. Seconded. All those in favour? All those against? I shall now proceed to deal with the reserve minutes. CB 21-55 and it's Council Cortell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's regrettable that we've been unable to find a way to assist our poorest citizens more profoundly. Um, concerning uh, the reduction council tax. And I'm sure that most of you can agree. Um, while we are making a difference to the lives of self-employed carers and the disabled, there are many more of us seriously disadvantaged who could be helped levelling up. Some of our poorest residents have the double whammy of energy bills rising around 50% next April, as well as having to live on £1,000 less per year because of the cut in universal credit. It's therefore extremely encouraging that £97,000 have been found through the Vulnerable Renters Scheme to help residents in the private sector who have fallen behind with their rent. It may not be a massive amount, but I applaud Councillor Terry Byrne and Joe Powell for this very welcome initiative. Any other councillor wishing to speak about this? Councillor? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, what, I, what I would say is uh, I agree with the report, but something I will say, the previous administration, as well as this one, if people are seriously unable to pay their council tax, and it's probably we're talking about the ones on 20% or even or comfortable with that, we 
do have the council's discretionary emergency fund, which um, I think last year paid out around about eighty thousand pounds. So this is a very caring council, and there are, are ways for individual cases to be taken up and dealt with. So um, I, I just want people to be aware of that. But we are doing what we can, but obviously our funds are limited. So there is support if you can't even afford the twenty percent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, are we? Anyone else would like to? Um... Councillor Kelman. No, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Cortell knows I share his sentiments uh, about this item, uh, and it's he's he is correct. Um, although I'm also at the same time very glad, uh, as the chair of the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group, uh, that some improvements were be able to were able to be made to this scheme, especially in relation to self-employed carers uh, and the disabled. Uh, and Councillor Clark is very right to highlight, uh, as I wish to again highlight, uh, the hardship fund that is available for those who are struggling. It's a very tough time at the moment, um, but this council cares, and we're going to do everything we can to help them get through it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Kelman. Is there anyone else? So could I have a mover, please, for the motion? Councillor Bayliss and a seconder. Councillor Cortell, thank you very much. All those in favour? All against? Is that motion carried? Motion carried. And then we move on to CB21 slash 56 and Councillor John Burns. Apologise, Madam Chairman. Uh, there are obvious uh, points in this that I agree with. Uh, the decision to split between town and country and to put something aside for climate change is very sensible. But I have to say that the way that we're going about this as a council seems to me wrong. And there was good reason why uh, the previous structure was as it was. What you really need to do when you're dealing with SIL and the allocation uh, between bids is to have a very clear policy and criteria on which those bids should be met. And it should be left to officers uh, to operate that policy and make the actual choice between bids. And there's a very clear reason why that is so. Uh, because if you actually involve members, and it is just members, because the officers are only going to support them, all of them will have a conflict of interest, a very straightforward conflict of interest. And even if they are absolutely straightforward and honest in what they're doing, they will be perceived by the man on the crap of omnibus as actually indulging in a recipe for sleaze. I wish it weren't so, uh, but that is the straightforward case. And I think we've got the policy really quite about face, and it should not be left to officers to actually deal with individual applications and grant and not grant them. Members, I mean. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Anyone else? Councillor Piljak. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in response to these comments, and thank you, uh, Councillor Barnes, for the comments, is that um, it was very interesting, the previous system of, of SIL funding, because, as you say, it was simply offices. And it was, I don't think, the way that a council should operate is just delegate such big decisions to offices without member input. There is going to be a panel, and the panel will be cross-party, and we have asked for community involvement, so all the parishes and actually each individual councillor has been asked for what they think are the infrastructure needs in their particular patch. So it would be up to officers to actually decide if the criteria, the applications are correct, and we'll make recommendations to the panel. So we've got to get this balance between openness, accountability, or behind closed doors. And the perception of the previous system was it was behind closed doors, 
secret decisions, and in fact, decisions we couldn't afford. There was one decision there that we actually couldn't afford. We didn't have the civil money for it. And so, in our view, this is a much better way of doing it. But we've always got the um, procedure that we can look at and review it after the first year. So the council will know, members of the public will know, what we are planning, what we are spending the money, infrastructure money on. And to us, that's a far, far superior way of dealing with such large amounts of money. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pilchak. Councillor Field? Councillor Field? Thank you, Chair. Clearly psychic, because I didn't think I'd indicated. Oh. But, as I'm on my feet, I might as well say something. I it's always listen to Councillor Barnes with interest, because I know um, government and local government is his field of expertise um, professionally and as a long-standing councillor. But if you continue that logic or that argument, it means that members would never, ever have any involvement at all in spending council money or taking part in panels. And I think we are all well able as members, and the public understands that we as members are here to advocate for our communities um, as well as to fulfil our duties to the council. We have a code of conduct by which we have to declare our interests and step aside when matters relating to those interests are being discussed um, at meetings. And I, for one, as Councillor Prochak said, much prefer an open system where we can do that um, than one which is always behind closed doors and always at the dis um, always decided by officers, for whom I have enormous respect, and clearly their expertise is very important, and they advise us very well. But ultimately, the people who spend public money are the members of the council. Thank you, Councillor Field. Councillor Menno? Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chairman. I think that, that some members maybe have misinterpreted what, what Councillor Barnes had said and, and the reasons why this group, this group will not support um, what is in front of us this evening. And the, and the fact, of the matter, fact of the matter remains that under uh, the previous administration, we were very clear that, in fact, um, major infrastructure projects would benefit um, from SIL funding. And indeed, some of those major infrastructure uh, projects would depend upon um, a, um, a high level of SIL funding for those projects to go forward. And we make no, no secret at all that one of those, for example, was the Bexhill Leisure Centre. And I think we need to be really, really clear that what, what the current proposals will lead to um, is perhaps a wider dispersal of SIL funding. But the reality is those key infrastructure um, um, proposals that were, that were on the table will have been deleted by this current administration. That's a fact. I can tell you now, Madam Chairman, that there will be no new Bexhill Leisure Centre under this administration because they have been very clear that it's, it's, it's in the too difficult bag and it will be kicked down the road. The previous administration were very clear that, that key infrastructure projects need to be funded a variety of ways and still was a way to do that. But I think that there, there is always room for adapting policies, policy being the key one here, because it needs to be a clear, defined, transparent policy. There needs to be a balance of perhaps officer and member involvement, and I'll be the first one to say that we should always take a fresh look at, at, at key things that this authority does. But what's in front of members this evening doesn't do what it should do. And as Councillor Barnes has alluded, the reality is that it will be perceived by members of the public that key members of the administration could have more influence perhaps than others upon what is going forward. So the reality is there needs to be those checks and balances. They're not in place as is proposed this evening. Thank you, Chairman, and that's why this group will not support those proposals. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Anyone else like to... Councillor Timpey? Oh. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure where Councillor Maynard gets his information from, but I'd like to be clear to the public and all the people that might be watching and here that we are not kicking into touch a leisure centre. We have a very, very defined strategy which... Sorry, excuse me. Would you like to say something? Um, could I ask you to please keep quiet till the council's finished speaking, please, Councillor Maynard? And it's currently, we are currently looking at different ways and we are going out to consultation once we have the strategy in place 
And I'm happy that you're laughing because I'm actually refuting everything you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Timpey. Anyone else? Councillor Pilger, I'm rising again on a point of information because, yes, the Leisure Centre was in the original SIL funding and the one, what they call the 123 list was actually, again, behind closed doors. And the, the actual funding for, the, for that Leisure Centre, as planned by the previous administration, could not be delivered. There was a shortfall of funding of about £7 million. And so the thing would have fallen apart straight away and there wouldn't have been enough SIL money to actually fund it. So that's a point of information. Thank you, Councillor Pager. Um, I think we've all spoken on this matter. Um, you've already had one question, Councillor no, Barnes. No, no, no. So do we have a proposal and second? Second? Okay, and do we take the vote? All in favour? Thank you. All against? Yeah. Carried. Okay, so we move on to CB, is that right? CB 21 slash 66, updated local plan enforcement plan. Uh, Councillor Kirby Green. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, yes, we welcome, or I welcome, anything that will help enforcement and uh, um, improve it across the district because it is a key issue, um, certainly amongst my electorate. Um, I suppose I'd just like to raise the issue that I know a number of parish councillors or Anglican council councils would like to have some form of consultation. Um, and I know that they, they sort of suggested this and, and raised it with a member of the cabinet, but it didn't actually happen. So I'd like to just, just ask that when this does go out to parish councils in terms of a briefing, that you know, parish councils can actually contribute and that the member, um, the yeah, member for this actually sort of takes on board comments and proposals that maybe they have that could um, actually improve this process. I know it's a process document, but I still think that the parish councils have something to add, and they're on the coalface quite often of enforcement. And I just like that, that confirmation that um, councillors and, and parish councils will be able to actually contribute moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No. Anyone else like to speak? Yeah, oh, sorry, Councillor Barnes. Councillor Pilcher, very gentlemanly, well, thank you. I'm, as Vice Chair of Planning, I was going to give way to you so I could hear what you were saying. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just echo some of Councillor Kirby Green's comments. I was at a meeting of uh, parish councillors. I am Chairman of Etchingham Parish Council. And there is... Uh, concern really constructive concern because they welcome the fact that we have an updated plan um, they welcome much that is in the plan uh, there are one or two comments they would have liked to have uh, had taken on board and they hope very much that there can be an early review in which they can feed their experience back in um, there are some drafting things too, which I think would make it clearer. Um, the major thing that is concerning uh, at the moment is the way that we have serial uh, planning applications on some uh, major developments, which are clearly an abusive process. And there is in this plan the very welcome statement uh, that there is now to be a presumption that a planning application will not be allowed to defer enforcement action unless the planning application is likely to be approved. And uh, I think we do need to look at our practice against this plan because I fear in one or two instances locally um, planning applications that are almost certain to be refused have been entertained in recent weeks. Um, and they, we know that they're likely to be refused 
because they've already been refused and they're being brought forward with very minor variations. And this is clearly an abusive process. So I welcome this. I welcome what the Vice Chairman, I suspect, is going to say, uh, which is we will be rigorous in looking at these serial planning applications because we have a number of cases across the northern parishes which have been going on since 2009. And uh, really, no enforcement action has been taken. And uh, that really is not something that the parishes can tolerate much longer. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Councillor Piljack? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I agree totally with what you're saying. And, and I think, I, I suspect it's Bexhill as well, but certainly in the rural areas, uh, the enf enforcement issues really raise temperatures. Um, there may be things going on behind the scenes of, of trying to get these things fixed, uh, but we're not aware of them, that kind of thing. Now, this, part, this, uh, this enforcement plan, it hasn't been updated for six years, so it was timely. It's good it was updated. Every member of this council had a chance to have a, a long session, and it was a long session, with the head of uh, with planning to actually put it, have their own input, and changes were made. And I do appreciate that if we'd done a full consultation, it would have gone out, uh, uh, several weeks longer. It would have added to it. But what the promise was, uh, the agreement was, that we would actually ha have a special teams meeting online for all the parishes to have their input. And as the officer said at the time, we can actually make adjustments and amendments after only a year. And like Councillor Barnes says, we should be rigorous about this. We should be looking at it. Maybe it's something that Scrutiny would like to pick up to, to actually look at more carefully to see our performance on that. I'm really pleased with the enforcement reports at the moment, and I don't know if, if people share my uh, pleasure in that, because you, get, you now get some reports that know what's happening. And that's such a big difference. Um, there's all these lovely what they call housekeeping reports, which actually things have been going on for years, and they've said, well, look, actually, there's no reason to enforce this anymore. Why is it in the pile of jobs? I agree with, totally. With, we share one. When I was her screening counsellor, we share one that's on, on the boundaries there. Dreadful. Um, and it's, it's cases like that that we need to get right. And I, I really hope that this plan will help us do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pilger. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? No? Would someone like to move it? Thank you. Second? That's please. Thank you very much indeed. All those in favour? All those against? Thank you very much. Agenda item eight, to receive the report of the Chief Executive in accordance with paragraph 17A of the Overview and Scrutiny Procedure Rules and paragraph four of the Budget and Policy Framework Procedure Rules of any urgent decisions taken at the Cabinet meetings held on the 4th of October, 8th of November or the 30th of December 2021. Councillor Oliver. Chairman, um, I'd like to move that the, be noted there were no urgent decisions taken at the Cabinet meetings held on the 4th of October, 8th of November, 13th of December or the 10th of January. Thank you, Councillor Piljack. I will now put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you. All those against? That's carried. Um, agenda item number nine, to receive the report of the Audit and Standards Committee on a matter for determination by a full council at its meeting held on the 6th of December. Councillor Dewan. Yeah, I move the report um, of the Audit and Standards Committee for determination on the 6th of uh, December. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeewon. Do we have a second? Councillor Tempe, thank you very much indeed. Um, 
If members wish to reserve an item for discussion, please indicate as I call over um, AS21-36, appointment of the external auditors. Where am I now? Okay. Number 10. Okay, so item number 10, to receive the report of the Chief Executive on a change to the political makeup of the Council and to consider and approve the allocations of committee seats and appointments, therefore. Councillor Oliver. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I would like to move the report. Do we have a second? Thank you, Councillor Projack. I will now put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Nobody against, so that's carried. Well, we've come to the end. We close uh, the meeting at 7.05. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>